Hey guys, what's going on? It's your boy Christian Israel and you are tuning in to the New Creation Capital Podcast, a place where we discuss what happens in the world today, where we talk about stories that focus on current events, the stock market, and digital assets. This is a new you, a new future, and a new creation. Thank you guys for tuning in so much. Today is April 4th. Of course, we filmed this the day before on April 3rd, but as of you listening to this, it is April 4th, and I want to thank you guys for tuning in. As always, you can see some of our old podcasts. Yesterday was episode 11, and the question is, was episode 11 is 5G a real threat? You can hear us on Apple Podcasts, Breaker, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Radio Public, Spotify, and of course, on our YouTube channel. Now, before we dive into today's story, which is going to be about what is Ripple's plan in 2020? We're going to listen to an interview by Brad Garlinghouse, the CEO of Ripple on Bloomberg in November. And then we're also going to look at who actually invests in Ripple and ask the question, is Ripple too big to fail? But before we do that, let's dive in and see what's going on in the markets. Currently in the crypto markets, we are on Comprica.com, as you can see. Um, let's see here. Bitcoin is currently up on the hour 0.36% and on the day 1.55% sitting at 16.788. Ethereum is up 0.24% on the hour up 0.79% on the day sitting at 142.29. And the number three in the market cap is XRP sitting at 17.9%. Up 0.1% on the hour, up just that little under a half percent on the day. So you can see what's going on there. Let's see how the market closed and stock market that closed on the day. Here we are on marketwatch.com. And we can see here that the Dow closed down 1.69% at 2152. We can see that the S&P 500 also closed down at 1.51% sitting at 2488. The NASDAQ also was down 1.53%, sitting at 73.73. And the global Dow was down 1.47%, sitting at 2364. Gold finished up 0.64. And oil had another up day for two days in a row. It's currently sitting up 12.2% at 2841. So we can kind of see if we go back and forth real quick. We can see that Bitcoin, Ethereum, the market in general is pretty much up. And then we go to the overall stock market here and see that it is down, but gold and oil all up. So we're seeing some kind of decoupling, okay? So before we go into today's story, let's jump over and look at a new story that jumps off uh, that hit me on usatoday.com. And it sits in the money section and it says, as coronavirus spreads, economy lost 700,000 jobs in March breaking a 10-year string of gains. This article was written by Paul Davis of USA Today, published today on April 3rd. So it says here, right here, it says, the U.S. lost 701,000 jobs in March, breaking a remarkable string of uninterrupted payrolls gains the past decade and revealing just the leading edge of the coronavirus-triggered hurricane that upended America's economy and labor market. The unemployment rate jumped from a 50-year low of 3.5% to a 4.4%, highest since August of 2017. The Labor Department said Friday that also the sharpest monthly rise in unemployment since January of 1975, according to the TD Economics. The report reflects employees' jitters early in the month over the unprecedented economic fallout from the pandemic but it doesn't capture the nearly 10 million people laid off and furloughed Americans like my stepfather who filed initial jobless claims the past two weeks as much of the nation's economy was shut down to contain the spread of the virus. And it finishes here that because labor's survey was conducted or that's because labor's survey was conducted the week ending March 14th before most states ordered residents to stay at home and non-essential businesses such as restaurants, movie theaters, and most stores to close. So I don't know what you guys feel about that, but we can see here that they also have, I know if you are on the YouTube right now, you can see this. If you are just listening to the podcast, you will not be able to see this part of it. However, we can see here a chart where we see the U.S. economy lost 701,000 jobs in March. 
You see here they have a chart from March 2010 to March 2020, and you see positive jobs, positive jobs, uh, where in May of 2010, 540,000 jobs were added, but we go to February of 2020, you see 275,000 jobs, and then the next month, minus 701. So that's kind of interesting. I hope you guys are doing okay. What do you guys think about that story? Let me know what your comments below. Are you being affected by this? Are you working at home? Does a shelter in place stop your employer from hiring you? Are you being furloughed or have you been laid off? What are you doing? Are you filing for unemployment? Um, I know there's a lot of people going on with the small businesses doing loans. And we heard a lot of Steve Mnuchin say that um, yesterday. On Twitter today, if we jump into the next story, we can see that Bank of America is not really working or doesn't seem to be working well with the Paycheck Protection Program. As you can see here by this tweet from, uh, from Bunnell Chris, he wrote, at Bank of America, it's not good enough to be a customer. Oh, at Bank of America, it's not good enough to be a customer to have access to the Paycheck Protection Program. You must also be a borrower. I will be moving all my accounts. Hashtag Paycheck Protection Program. Hashtag BA. Hashtag Bank of America. So I decided to click on it and see exactly what he's talking about. And you can see here, after he applied for this, now this is at Bank of America. I don't know about Chase or U.S. Bank or some of the other larger banks or even the credit unions, what's going on. But this is the reply he got. And he's not the only one. I'll show you in a second. He says, Based on our records, your account doesn't qualify to apply for a Paycheck Protection Program loan through Bank of America. To apply for a Paycheck Protection Program loan through Bank of America, you must have an existing small business relationship with the following. Number one, small business checking open no later than February 15, 2020. Small business lending relationship inclusive of credit card open no later than uh, February 15, 2020. Online banking username and password. If you don't meet the qualifications to apply through Bank of America, please contact your primary business lender to visit S or visit SBA.gov. Now, you see here, that's no big deal. You see the small business checking account open before February. Okay, cool. But here's the catch. Small business lending relationship inclusive of credit card open no later than February 15th, 2020. That means you needed to borrow money already. A lending relationship means you needed to already be in debt. So if you had good cash flow, if you didn't have a credit card with them, they're not going to give you money, which is interesting, which I assume this is why when you look and you go through hashtag Bank of America, and look, you see all these people uh, going through the same thing, getting the same responses. You see uh, here at MJI route, ouch, Bank of America playing gatekeeper on otherwise available hashtag PPP relief funds by requiring previously purchased and unrelated Bank of America products. So if you were not in debt with Bank of America, they're not going to give you the money that the government has given them to giving you. Wow, that's a tongue twister. What do you think about that? Like we're supposed to be getting this money as a small business owner. I'm supposed to be able to walk into my bank, show them, you know, the payroll help or that I've been hurt by COVID-19 or whatever it may be, show them my paperwork or apply for it. And I'm supposed to be able to get this money immediately. Instead, now you see banks like Bank of America saying, nope, you're not in debt with us. Since you're not in debt with us, we can't loan it to you. What do you guys think about that? Again, that shows how corrupt the banks are and what's wrong with the banks. My personal opinion here, this is not financial advice. This is why I don't really like to work and promote the banks. This is probably why you're in the cryptocurrency space in the first place, because the way America is built with the central banks is built on debt. The more debt you have, the more off you are. The more debt you have, the better credit score you have, but it's just enough debt to say you're okay. And it doesn't make sense to me that in order to be considered a good business person, you have to have some debt. It makes no sense. When I'm working on my debt with my company, not my debt, my credit score as a company, they said, hey, open up some credit cards and hold 30% debt. Why would I want to hold debt? I don't want debt. And then if it, even if you get your credit checked, it hits your debt and it hurts you as a hard line spike. That makes no sense. So let me know what you think about this. 
have you tried to do a Bank of America um, loan yet with the uh, per personal protection payments? Um, let me know because we see here that's again, Steve Mnuchin used the word unbanked yesterday and working with all the small banks and the small businesses and the large businesses. However, I don't know, it doesn't work well for me. So before we go into today's story, again, we're gonna touch on is Ripple too big to fail? We're also gonna go over, let's see here, uh, an article that lists the full list of Ripple customers and we'll also dive into another place about everyone who's invested in it. It's kind of what we're gonna do a dive in today of. So before we dive in, we're gonna go over a video that is from Bank XRP and they showed this interview of Brad Garlinghouse from 2019. So let's go ahead guys and dive into this story. Blockchain technology is rapidly moving into the mainstream, and our next guest wants one of the leading players. Let's bring in Ripple CEO Brad Garlington. Uh, good to have you with us, Thank Brad. You. Uh, it's been a year since we saw each other. Let's talk about XRP, which facilitates instant payments between parties like banks. I mean, what kind of traction are you seeing? Well, I'm incredibly pleased to see how much traction people are seeing with let's solve a real problem with digital assets. You know, historically, I think there's been a lot of hype in the crypto ecosystem, a lot of uh, experiments, and we're able to look at what we're doing with XRP and really accelerate the adoption and take help banks take advantage of what is possible through these digital assets. Of course, there is an entrenched player already in SWIFT. I mean, how much are you denting the business of SWIFT? Well, so we look at SWIFT as a company that has certainly defined how cross-border payments have been enabled. That's also existed for a couple decades, really almost four decades for how that system works. We feel like there's an opportunity to bring the system into the modern world or into the internet world where today a swift transaction can take days. You don't know for sure if it's been, that it's arrived. It's almost like a postcard. The only way you know is your friend says, hey, I, I received that. And I think in a world of the internet where people expect I can order an Uber and it shows up right away, you know, a Gojek, what have you, these are the expectations people have with regard to how financial systems should work in the modern era. Brad, tell me here then, you know, where does this go? I mean, let's have a look at uh, just uh, effectively what we have. We've got so many cryptocurrencies out there. Uh, you know, you're one of the uh, front runners, but the thing is, are there too many of you guys? You know, actually, I agree with you. Uh, I think there are too many. Uh, there are around 3,000 different digital assets that trade on a daily basis now. I think, you know, anytime there's a new market, there's a lot of people that run into that market and try to show that they can solve a problem, they can deliver a customer need. I have said publicly before that I think 99% of all crypto probably goes to zero. But there is that 1% where I think that is focused on solving a real problem for real customers and is able to do that at scale. And that's gonna be game changing. And I think that's gonna continue to grow significantly in the decades ahead. I mean, they're probably one of the reasons why there is so much instability in terms of the price here. But you know, you want to be a, well, you are a currency, you want to be a unit of transfer here. But the, the problem is if you transferred some money to somebody else, uh, that may be worth much less by the, time it, by the time they want to actually cash it in, if they do cash it in. So you know, how do you actually produce some stability in all this? You know, it turns out this is a, a, a false narrative. Uh, it turns out when you enable a swift transaction, volatility is a calculation of both time and volatility. So a swift transaction can take two to three days where an XRP transaction takes a few seconds. And it, it turns out the volatility of enabling a swift transaction is much higher than enabling an XRP transaction because of the time. We actually just did a post on the Ripple website explaining the math behind this, but it turns out that the volatility risk is lower with an XRP transaction. Uh, investors are pretty concerned about the sell-off we're seeing in Ripple, and they say that it is bigger than expected. Is there reason to be worried about it? Well, I think probably the sell-off in XRP versus the sell-off in you know, Ripple is a private company. We have our shareholders. It's, uh, you can't trade Ripple shares, so to speak. Uh, XRP, you know, look, we pay attention over the long haul. I tell the employees I don't think about it on a three days or three weeks or three months. You know, the, the, taking advantage of what digital assets can do to make transactions more efficient, I think is a journey we'll be on for a decade or two. I described it as a marathon and we're on kind of mile two. 
So I don't think about the price of XRP in, a, in the short term. I think if we can enable XRP to be the most efficient, measured by speed of a transaction, the cost of a transaction, so, more and so, more people so will use it. nothing to be worried about. Nothing to be worried about when we take a look at this sell-off. I, I think there's going to continue to be volatility in crypto broadly, right? The whole market kind of moves together a little bit. And there's times when XRP has outperformed Bitcoin. There's times it's underperformed Bitcoin. But I think as you look at this as a, a long-term journey, I'm quite optimistic about where we see the whole market. There's a lot of bullish trends for the whole crypto ecosystem. Brad, then, of course, you know, people, uh, other people and some of the big players want to get a slice of the action. And I'm talking about Libra. Now, tell me about your concerns about Libra and some of the things which Libra does represent which are good. Well, I think what's good is I, a number of people, obviously, in the crypto space, and certainly what Ripple has embraced, is this idea of how do we reduce friction? How do we reduce cost? How do we bring people who are unbanked or underbanked into the financial system? And so that's a vision we certainly embrace. And Facebook's effort to kind of go direct to consumer, I think, is one approach. The challenge is, I think, that all financial systems, all financial tools, they're built on trust. And it, with Facebook as the lead horse around Libra, I think it's fair to say, excuse me, Facebook has really had a trust deficit based upon a lot of things that have happened to the company and the things they have done. So I think it's going to be hard for Libra to kind of using that foundation of trust from Facebook to get a lot of momentum. As you know well, there's a lot of regulatory scrutiny and questions that are still not yet answered. I think the good news is key people like Mark Zuckerberg have said they won't go live until those things are clarified. Uh, Jamie Dimon says, nice idea, but it won't happen. Is it too soon to write it off? I think it's too soon to write it off, but I, I also think you obviously seen a lot of the momentum shift. It came out in June with a lot of excitement and enthusiasm. Since that time, you've seen the likes of MasterCard and PayPal and others step away. Although I think a lot of that's because of the regulatory uncertainty. I think Facebook took a pretty aggressive, arguably maybe naive a little bit, that they could just run into this and, and, and do this despite a lot of concerns. I think certainly the way Ripple approaches the world is we're going to work with regulators. We're going to partner with them from the earliest stages. We've done that here in Singapore. We've done that around the world. And I think that has served us well in terms of building momentum across all of our customers. Uh, Brad, my final question is, you know, we've got so many of these cryptocurrencies starting, you know, I've already asked you about that. A lot of them are going to fall by the wayside. And no doubt you're going to still be there in a year's time. But how will this ecosystem look in a year from now? That's a great question. I think the system is going to continue to evolve where years ago, really, crypto was solving a little bit of illicit, you know, kind of Silk Road and illicit use cases. Then it moved to really a speculative bubble that we saw. And I think you're going to continue to see in 2019 and 2020 and beyond the focus on utility. How are these technologies, how are these digital assets solving real problems for real customers? And absent that real utility, I don't think you're going to see the whole market grow uh, and live up to its potential. It's the reason why Ripple has been so focused on a specific customer, a specific problem, and we've been fortunate to build a lot of momentum with that customer set. Brad, always good to have you with us. Ripple CEO Brad Galling has there here in the Lion City. Still to come. So what do you think about that? I, I think it's pretty interesting. I would, if I was you, I'd go back and listen to it one more time. And again, this is in 2020. He need made a statement how he believes that most of the cryptocurrencies in the market right now will go to zero. It's interesting because he believes only 1% are going to work for utility case. And I think he's got a good point. We've got a lot of cryptocurrencies out there, over 5,000 on the coin market cap, but 3,000 that trade daily. And as a day trader myself, I trade a lot of these back and forth, but I don't hold a lot. Again, my portfolio really doesn't consist of too many actual currencies and digital assets to hold again i hold bitcoin and xrp ethereum bat uh linked uh, ada and a couple others but really again my number one portfolio piece is xrp and this is kind of why i dive into it and share it with you guys now again the other question of the day is xrp too big to fail and the reason i say that is because what's going on these guys were evaluated at 10 billion dollars earlier in the year and so I wanted to look in to see who has been investing in them. And we can see here by this on this article on CaptainAltcoin.com written by Sarah Warfel on January 1st, 2019. So this is a year ago, well, a little more than a year ago. And it's titled, Too Big to Fail, 10 Renowned Investors That Invested in Ripple Development. XRP Main Source of Funding for the Future. Now, 
if Brad Garlinghouse is there and he's just a cryptocurrency, I had a call this morning, people asking why will people want to invest in XRP or why, what's the utility case? Why do people jump on? Well, to see if it's going to be a successful uh, technology, we got to see who's behind it. So let's go back a little bit and see who is in this funding since they started in 2012 as not even OpenCoin, but moved on to Ripple using the utility token XRP. And we can see here, and now I will do a deep dive into each one of these later as this podcast grows. But for now, let's just look at the back of the people who invest. We have Accenture, who invested $55 million in Ripple Labs. We have Adrausen Orowitz, founded in 2009, who invested $2.5 million into Ripple. Then we have CME Ventures, which I'm sure you recognize as the Chicago Merchile Exchange who pushes Bitcoin, Ethereum futures, but you actually don't see XRP or Ripple on their platform. But however, behind the scenes, they've invested $55 million in these guys. Then you have Core Innovation Capital, who've invested 28 million in these, or actually 3.5 million in these guys, and then teamed up with other companies and did another 28 million. Then you have Google Ventures, who put in $3 million. Then you have the bank uh, Santander InnoVentures, put another 55 million dollars into them then you have the sbi group based in tokyo who put another 55 million dollars into them then you have scb digital ventures who put a hundred million dollars into these guys then you have seagate who 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 formed with uh, another company that we saw earlier then you see standard chartered put another 55 million into these guys okay so in a total over the past few years ripple has collected a total of 96 million dollars Uh, to build its own infrastructure and the Ripple network. Recent reports of partnerships, corporations give rise to suspicion that some of the above-mentioned investors do not invest altruistically in fintech from East Coast. In the future, Ripple says it wants to finance itself by selling XRP tokens. Now, when they say sell XRP tokens, I think it's important because, you know, the lawsuits is XRP a commodity, is XRP a security. Well, we've seen interviews where... Brad Garlinghouse says Ripple doesn't need XRP to form as a company. They use XRP as a utility token to move through the inner ledger protocol to move the money and use the transactions. So XRP is a part of Ripple, but it's not necessarily all of Ripple. Ripple on its own is the technology, the R3, which is with Swift, which we talked about, right? The X Rapid and how all that moves and interlocking all the banks together. And they use XRP to move it. So that's important. And it says here, Ripple itself looks its future accordingly. Sorry, Ripple itself sees its future positively. CEO Brad Garlinghouse is of the opinion that at least 100 partner banks will use cryptocurrency by the end of 2019. Now we see there, he says at least 100. So what I want to do is kind of dive in and look the next thing to see a full list of actual partners. And I found um, this one here is uh, an article on publishedox.com, which I use to publish all of these podcasts as well, another platform, but this is written by XRP underscore Gato. And it's titled full list of ripple customers, 2019, 2020 update. So we're going to look and just see who they're partnered with. Um, And let's go ahead and scroll down here. And we, and now if you want to read the article, it's a great dive in, but this is as as close as you can get to who they have right now. So let's just talk about the banks they're partnered with. We just dove in and saw the people who invest in them. Now let's look at who they're partnered with. I'm not going to read all of these. I'll just read probably top 10 of each. Maybe we got American Express. These are the banks. Standard Charter, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, PNC Financial, Colix, Catalyst Corporation, Federal Credit Union, Star One Credit Union, CBW Bank, Cross River Bank, Royal Bank of Canada, uh, Scotia Bank, Bank of Montreal, Euro Bank, Bank of England, HSBC, Barclays, and I'm scrolling down and reading what I see that pops up. UBS, um, Ak Bank. Uh, let's see here. First Bank of Abu Dhabi, uh, Saudi Arabian Monetary Authority, Central Bank. Um, let's see, Singapore Exchange, Bank of Thailand, Bank of Indonesia, Siam Commercial Bank, which we also saw uh, SCB as an investor, Shanghai Bank, SBI Holdings, Mitsubishi, UFI Financial Group, 
Uh, let's see here. I'm scrolling down. I'm on round 84 banks now. Uh, Sony Bank, uh, Bank of Rukukis. Let's see here. Hiroshima Bank. A lot of Japanese banks here. A lot of Chinese banks here. Westpac is also there. National Australia Bank, which I think they just got on. Commonwealth Bank of Australia as well. Now, on this list is 118 banks alone. So he said in that interview, he wants at least 100 banks. But now we see here, he's got over 100 banks at the beginning of 2020 that he is now partnered with. If we continue to look down and see who he's done, who they've done the money transfers firms with, we go back and we have another list here. So this is remittance, cross-border payments, and money transfers, how to move money back and forth. You have American Express, uh, International Payments, Instagram, Sinfrem, BTEC, uh, Transpago, Unipay, MoneyGram, which I'm sure you recognize, Western Union, UAE Exchange, TransferGo, SBI Remit, Earthport. There's 16 direct things that they work with. You got two big ones that we know worldwide, Western Union and MoneyGram. Then we see the foreign exchange companies that they work with, and this is moving exchanges you know, across, which is, there's only seven of them. Currency Direct, FairFX, Rational Exchange, Exchange for Free, Bex Banco, uh, Easy Forex, Flash Exchange. Then we have cryptocurrency exchanges, which there are a lot more now, so this is not really updated, but according to this one, it's Coin One, SBI Virtual Currencies. Then we can see the payment providers that they're using. We can see the technology they've combined with, and then some miscellaneous like Deloitte, Accenture, uh, Arrington, XRP Capital. We make price selling, the Asian MTM Group. IDT and buy Twitter. So he asked this question at the end, will Ripple replace Swift? And we know that they work with Swift, that Swift actually uses the R3 technology. So that's a little outdated, but make sure you go ahead and jump on this. I'll put this link in the description of the podcast. Uh, again, it's called full list of Ripple customers, 2019 to 2020 update by XRP underscore Gato on publishox.com. Okay, again, I want to know what you think. You can find us on our Twitter page. If I can actually find the Twitter link here. There you go. New creation cap. You can see it right there. Follow us. Let me know. Converse with me. Continue to let me know what you think. Uh, If you're on YouTube, leave a comment below. Subscribe, follow, like, do all the social media things. As I've said, you can find us on the podcast area. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're on Breaker. We are on Google Podcasts, Pocket Podcasts. Radio Public, Spotify, and of course, our anchor, pl- our anchor platform where you can partner with us or you can leave us a video message or an audio message and let us know what you think. Really, really appreciate it. Now, in this in this uh, article, uh, XRP Gato gives us another link that I don't have up right now, but I'll go into a, something called app.dillroom.com. And what you can do is dive into the back of that and you can see more about what's going on on Ripple. And Ripple is very transparent because they are a company that wants to do an IPO. We don't know when they're going to do an initial public offering, but they could be the first of the digital asset world to do it. And you can see that they've launched in 2012. They have over 500 employees and their current evaluation as of December 2019 is $10 billion. So we see all these things going on with all all these other digital assets, all these coins or tokens having issues with the SEC. What's up with the evaluation of $10 billion? Because obviously Ripple is working behind the scenes with the regulators. And that's the thing they push. So you can see here, the round of C, Ripple funding. You see everyone they're working with. And I don't see anyone here that sticks out too much right now um, without us digging more. Once we dig more, we can see more. So if you get a chance, jump on this um website here app.dearroom.co and i'll leave a link here and you can go right into what is going on with xrp and what is going on with ripple all right well let's close out with the last story of the day this came into my email from quickbooks.intuit.com and it reads how the stimulus package benefits small business and self-employed now a lot a lot of you people who probably listen to this are either a small business owner uh, uh, a crypto trader or you are self-employed which kind of All of those things are the same thing. And we started the story talking about the Bank of America with the people trying to get the the loans, how they're saying, nope, here's other restrictions. Well, let's go over and see how this actually helps. Um, I'm someone who does their own taxes and I do all my stuff on QuickBooks. They are not a sponsor. I pay to use their stuff. They do not pay me to talk about it. And this is not financial advice. However, this is still a good article. 
So we can see here, they're a little behind as far as how many people file for unemployment. We're not gonna talk about that. We know it's now up over 7 million people, but we know that on March 27th, the president signed a $2, million, a $2 trillion plan to stimulate the economy uh, called the CARES Act, right? But And we know that it goes to $1,200 per person. Um, if you make $75,000 or less, married couples $150,000, um, you will receive, both of you guys will receive $1,200, also an additional $500 for anyone under the age of 16. Um, we all know that, we know that, but let's go down here, which is more important, payroll tax relief for business owners, okay? If you are a small business owner, the stimulus plan grants small business owners tax credits, defers payment taxes through 2020, so they can continue to pay the employees. Employers will be eligible for the payroll tax as long as they keep workers employed amidst the COVID-19 related shutdowns. Employers who apply for small business loans do not qualify for payroll tax, okay? So if you get the business loan, which they're offering you, right? We hear this uh, SBA.gov business loan. If you also try to get the payroll tax credit, then you can't get that. And I think that's the most important part of this. Even though they're giving you the tax relief through 50% through 21, and then another 50% through 22, right? The issue is you still have bills to pay. So if you keep your employees on, you can either get the loan or you can get the payroll tax. You can't do both. So make sure you guys understand that. Um, that's pretty important. I would go through and read the rest of the article. We even talk about who is eligible for unemployment benefits. That's important. There is a thing on there, by the way, for those of you who are behind in your child support, you cannot get these loans. Keep that in mind. So if you have lost your job and you need to pay your child support and you're not able to and you are haven't paid your child support since February, you are not eligible for these loans. Um, that is really, really important. Um, also, there's a federal student relief. So people who are still paying their loans, there's no interest. You still owe. Um, but it says during these six months, the department will suspend involuntary collections such as wage garment, gar garnishments related to the loan. So if they're doing, if they're coming after your money already, they'll suspend that. If you have interest on your loans, they'll stop that. However, in the meantime, you still have to pay it. Um, I don't know if there's any, I haven't seen anything about rent freezes yet or mortgage freezes yet, but I will be on the lookout for that. So that's the end of today's stories. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you guys continue to hit me up. Uh, you can check us out again on New Creation Capital Podcast, a place where we discuss what happens in the world today. We talk about stories that focus on current events, including the stock market and digital assets, because this is a new you, a new future, and a new creation. Yesterday's episode was episode 11, and we focused on, is 5G really a threat? But before we go today, I'm going to do as I always do, and I'm going to read a scripture to you. Today's scripture is going to be, Proverbs 16 verses 1 through 4 and it goes like this to humans the plans of the to humans belong the plans of the heart but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue all a person's ways seem pure to them but motives are weighed by the Lord commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans so again I know I give scripture every single time and that's just something I want to do today a lot of people feel like they're doing the right thing but the Lord knows your heart the Lord knows your motives, and that's more important than anything else. So for you that are out there doing things that are helping people and maybe other people are not appreciating it, this is to you guys. This is to those who are out there who don't feel appreciated. The Lord appreciates you and the work that you are doing, and I personally want to thank you. Again, thank you guys for stopping by. Please converse on New Creation Capital. Um, that is us. You can go to New Creation Cap. Here is our Twitter page. You can go along. We got some of the newest news on there, some charts, there's some TA. I'm going to start some TA now that I'm doing screen recording and start putting up some TA next week, guys. But in the meantime, please make sure you subscribe to the podcast. Again, we are on Apple, Breaker, Google, Pocket, Radio Public, Spotify, and of course, the Anchor platform. So thank you guys, as always, for hanging out with me. And as I like to say, buy low, sell high. This is your boy, Christian, Christian Israel. Thank you guys so much. This is a new you, a new future, and a new creation. Until next time, guys, peace and love. Later.